Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. So, uh, today I have uh, gone back to my first year of undergrad uh, for a book that was assigned to me when I took a course on Asian art and art history. So, Myths and Symbols in Indian Art and Civilization is not... I mean, the bulk of it was in its way written by Heinrich Zimmer. However, the editor's foreword clarifies that Heinrich Zimmer died suddenly of pneumonia two years after his arrival in the United States in 1943. And what happened was that uh, several people, most significantly Joseph Campbell, yes, THE Joseph Campbell, uh, you want to know about Joseph Campbell, you should probably look up Star Wars and Joseph Campbell, probably the most well-known of Joseph Campbell's things in the wider world. Um, uh, that is, Star Wars and the uh, hero's cycle or the hero's journey and concepts associated therewith and how Star Wars functions as a matter of, oh, uh, uh, not in terms of concrete character, but in terms of archetypes. That it's it's fundamentally just archetypes, but that's, first of all, not really our bailiwick, because we do, you know, books here and not movies. Or television shows, comic books, or the extended universe, which, Jesus Christ, why, Disney, why didn't you listen to George Lucas and allow the extended universe to just exist as the thing? But anyways, moving on. Heinrich Zimmer. He died, and he left behind uh, several lectures that had, quote, been roughly typed and arranged for conversion into books. A volume on Hindu medicine was half completed. An introduction to the study of Sanskrit had been outlined. A popular work on mythology had been begun. And so various people, most particularly Campbell, sifted through all of this stuff and created a and created a book, a reworking of a lecture course delivered at Columbia University in 1942. And so they compiled a book, and uh, supplementary notes were added by a Dr. Ananda K. Uh, Kumaraswamy, who uh, basically uh, helped clarify things since Joseph Campbell was, after all, not the world's greatest expert in Indian art and civilization. He was just a very, very excellent theorist in in such uh, in terms of, of such things. Uh, so in this book, uh, the annotation that there are some plates, some of the uh, pictures that appear in the course of this book, or rather in the end section of this book, such as this one, um, which I picked more because it's one of the better plates in the back, uh, plates being a relative term, since these are unfortunately, in my opinion, rather poorly reproduced black and white photographs that somebody had taken photographs, and they've been not hugely well produced in the back of this book, but anyways, uh, he didn't have annotations and credits for these, and so some of the illustrations and myths remain uncredited simply due to an inability to track down the source. Um, so the thing about this book is that because we in the West as a general rule, and the further back you go, the more this applies, have a limited understanding of not merely uh, Eastern philosophy, etc., etc., but the simple, uh, the fundamental educational background to understand uh, symbolism, to translate symbols and images from other cultures. I mean, you look at this, Shiva Shakti, uh, Bengal, 10th century AD. Uh, that is what we used to call CE. For those of you who are too young to remember, back when we called things AD, uh, 
In a bygone era, there was B.C. before Christ and A.D. Anno Domini, as in Year of Our Lord, which is Latin. Uh, but they have since changed it to B.C.E. before Common Era and C.E. Common Era. Uh, they're the same thing, and I feel that there is a certain amount of intellectual dishonesty in changing it, but at the same time I understand that they are attempting to distance themselves from a significantly Christian perspective and push this back into a... Uh, into a more secular and... Uh, thus generalist view given how we date things in the West and so on and so forth. Neither here nor there, just, you know, side issue. Um, but the thing is that that if you don't know under, if you don't know Shiva Shakti, if you don't understand this is the god Shiva with his female counterpart Shakti acting as opposing principles of ma male and female. If you don't understand uh, this ongoing fundamental duality that, uh, at least according to this book, exists at the center of, of Indian uh, philosophies, that is, the, the philosophies that derive out of, out of more fundamentally Indian... Uh, religions, that is, religions that evolved in that region, uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism, which sort of have a, a coherent uh, philosophical uh, collective point of origin uh, that, uh, that, feeds into, that feeds into a regional worldview. Uh, but if you don't understand all of these things, some of this stuff you you'll understand you can pick it out it's you know two people and the dude has a lot of arms uh has more arms than is the standard for human people uh and he is sitting there with his you know female person next to him and they are looking at each other with some affection but there's a lot of symbolism. There's symbolism in him holding the beads, in him holding the trident, in what in the lotuses that they are standing on, in the animals that are underneath them. All of this is is a lot of symbolism. And if you don't if you don't understand that, or at least understand sort of the fundamental underlying uh, cultural structures, it's very much harder to get everything out of this that is intended. And so there's a lot in this book which is discussing fundamental philosophy. He spends a certain amount of time, I grant you, on... Uh, he, he spends a certain amount of time, of course, discussing what the various symbols are, discussing what's in the pictures. Uh, that uh, is a bit of a problem uh, because some of these are not so well reproduced. But anyways... The thing about this, though, is that it's very, very interesting in terms of just giving you some sort of a basis, some sort of a grounding, especially those of us, again, from the West who are coming at this from a very Judeo-Christian perspective. It helps to, to reposition and rearrange and explain these things in a way that that clarifies for those of us on the outside. Um, here are some other images from the back uh, that have to do, again, with Shiva. I didn't really realize that I had been doing a lot of Shiva stuff, but I had. Um, anyhow, it's I, I find it very interesting. Equally interesting, of course, is that this book, it has its strangenesses, and I think some of those strangenesses have to do with the fact that this was a not edited book. It was compiled out of a man's notes. It was not, it, it, it was not finessed directly by the person himself. And so there are some issues in this book that I suspect might have been better smoothed out had had Dr. Zimmer survived long enough to uh, to really 
clear uh, to to sort of clear up what he was doing. But it's nonetheless very very interesting to see all of these bits and pieces of Indian myth, which admittedly have been pulled out of context, and it might have been valuable. And it might be valuable, of course, to to read some of the major uh, uh, texts of of these myths, um, if only to create a greater context. But this starts with the te this book opens with a tale, the Parade of Ants, which is a story of of uh, this particular god Indra and and his discovery of the greatness, the size of eternity, uh, and finishing with also his discovery, uh, finishing with his wife calling upon another wise man to remind him that uh, as big as the size of eternity is, you also exist in the moment and in the present. And uh, that you do have to exist in the world. Um, so it's it it's it's a story that sort of is is in many ways it creates a a fundamental understanding of of the dichotomy of spirit and and physical being that we all exist in the world. Uh, but that at the same time as we exist in the world, that there is a greater eternity that cannot be seen and that should be striven for. But at the same time, if you exist in the world, you should maybe also strive for having an existence in the world. Um, and this this spirit uh, and and physical being dichotomy is much discussed. Um, and part of the issue here, of course, is that India has Hinduism and Buddhism, they have this tradition of reincarnation, this tradition of believing that you are on this wheel of reincarnation, that you come around again and again and again. And it creates a certain internal perspective that is very, very different from the Judeo-Christian one of you get this go-round and then it's over, so you better do what you can do right here and now. And it's something that tends to cause uh, some Christian sects to really, really just fling themselves headlong into, you know, trying to be very purely concerned with the spiritual and other people to become very, very purely concerned with the material uh, but this this back and forth, at least in terms of uh, in terms of Hinduism in particular, is is it creates a very different fundamental psychology. Now, um, the other thing, of course, is that this book then finishes with a, a funny story pulled out of pulled from the Jewish tradition about a rabbi living in uh, Krakow and uh, that uh, Rabbi Asik, son of Rabbi Jekyll, living in the ghetto of Krakow, uh, had years of affliction and then dreamed that uh, he would find a hidden treasure buried under a bridge in Prague and he goes, treks, him off, treks off to Prague and has a conversation with one of the guards who is curious about why he's hanging around and the guard tells him that the guard had had a dream that there would be a treasure hidden in that rabbi's home behind the stove so he goes home and indeed finds a treasure hidden behind his stove uh it's it's an odd ending to this book um anyways here's the problem with the plates in the back you look at the top one it's virtually incomprehensible. Um, and I it's it's I think the biggest problem with this book, in my opinion, is those plates.
Uh, otherwise, it's a fascinating read, uh, especially for those of us who know absolutely nothing about it. And I think that's all, so I'll see you all next week.